Good morning. My name is Associate Professor Jeff Sussman from the Faculty of Medicine, Nursing and Health Sciences at Monash University. It is my great pleasure to present this session on wound dressings, which I've entitled, Not All Dressings Are Created Equal. I have no conflicts in relation to this particular presentation. So what is the role of a dressing? Well, the role of a dressing is to provide the best environment for wound healing. When you combine this with the management of the cause of the wound and addressing the factors, both intrinsically and extrinsically, that will impact on the ability of a wound to heal. When making your choices, you have to think about the patient. Cost is always an issue, and one of the misconceptions is that modern wound treatment is expensive. Hopefully from today, I'll be able to, in fact, uh, change your thinking. It's not the cost of the product that's important. It's the cost of managing the wound. And because of that, if you can find a dressing which can remain in place for four, five, six, seven days, in the long run, it's a lot cheaper than something that might cost you a dollar, but has to be changed two or three times a day. So you have to think about that. Sometimes when cost is such an issue, and absorption is one of the things we need to look at, then something as simple as incontinence pads are certainly something that you could consider. It's also important to think about the uh, willingness of a patient to in fact stick to the regimen you've in fact created. So you have to spend some time and just explain what it is you're trying to do and why using particular products. Comfort is important because if a wound is painful, if a wound product is, is sticks, if there are problems with use of the product, then they won't use the product. Exudate is also a problem. It can be socially isolating and uh, many dressings that are used are inadequate in trying to solve the problem. Smell. Odour is always a problem. One of the things that we would tend to use with odorous wounds is topical metronidazole gel. Why do we use top topical metronidazole gel? Because the smell is usually caused by anaerobes and a few days of just simple metronidazole gel will get rid of the anaerobes. But also there are other products which I'll talk about later that can be an issue because an odour has an impact on the patient themselves, on their ability to socialise and on their family. Bleeding. Bleeding from cancerous wounds and other wounds that are very fragile, this can be a problem. So you have to think about the use of hemostatic dressings. Infection is always a problem, particularly with the diabetic patient or the immunocompromised patient and certainly older frail patients. So if you think a wound is infected, then it needs to be treated. But swabbing is not the answer because every wound you swab will grow bacteria. You need to really assess clinical signs and if necessary, then perform a biopsy. Again, many patients are very uh, concerned about the way that they look and they need to look at products that are gonna minimize this excessive bulk of a dressing so that they, they can't be seen as having a major problem there. So what are some general rules about uh, using dressings? Well, you should always allow at least two to three centimeters of the dressing bigger than the wound. And you might say, why? Well, a wound is much more than just the wound that you see because you need to allow uh, levels for absorption. There are some dressings that have to go in wounds like fibers. But generally speaking, we want them to be much bigger. You need to put a third above and two thirds below. Why? Gravity. Uh, dressing, uh, uh, exudate will only flow one way downhill. So if you put one third and two thirds, you will find that you'll increase the wear time quite significantly of the product you use. So that's important. Don't take them off too quickly. This is a major fault that people do and be very careful with older people. I have a simple rule, don't stick anything on to an older person, because as sure as God made little green apples, when you take it off, you'll remove skin and you'll have a bigger problem. Well, often we say, just remove them under the shell, let them get wet and they'll fall off. Don't pre-moisten alginates. If the 
Enginate the wood is not sufficient to gel an alginate, don't use an alginate. Remember, there's no universal dressing. You've got to look at the appropriate dressing as the wound changes. Here's an example. You can see on this side, they've allowed about three centimeters bigger than the wood. That's, that's good. I had to take the picture. The person was cutting the dressing to the size and shape of the wound. How, how long do you think this lasted? About an hour. Was that cost effective? No, it wasn't. And you see, people see a little bit of moisture on the dressing. Oh, better remove it. Wrong. See a little bit more messy, uh, moisture on the dressing. Remove it. Wrong. You wait until the edge of it gets to the edge of the wound because all of this <coughs> is in the dressing. It's not in the wound itself. You can divide dressings into two broad categories. The inert or passive dressings, the plug and conceals, and the interactive bioactive dressings. The inert dressings, your cotton wool, your gauzes, your combines, your tules, your uh, non-occlusive dressings. They will either absorb or not absorb. And you'll disagree with me, but they're expensive. Why are they expensive? If you have to change them two or three times a day, even though they might cost a dollar, at the end of the week, you've spent $20. Whereas a modern dressing will absorb or not absorb or donate moisture to provide a lovely moist environment. They are cheaper because you change them less frequently. Even a dressing that costs $5, if it lasts for a week, it's far cheaper than a $1 dressing. And they're also pain relieving. So your passive dressings, like your gauzes, your lids, your non-sticks, your tools, really have very little role as a primary dressing. Maybe as a secondary dressing, but not as a primary dressing. And here's a good example. The doctor had in fact applied gauze directly on the wound itself, directly on the wound. You can see the way granulation tissue has grown through the wound and is now embedded. Now I could have just ripped this off I had to get a scalpel and cut it off. Wrong. And just to prove the point, this is a study that Ria Martin and I did at the Austin. We compared two groups of patients, one getting gauze and saline four times a day, the gauze and saline cost next to nothing, the other getting very expensive dressing. And then at the end of the week, look at the cost. The gauze and saline group, $248 a patient, the expensive dressing group, $17, which is cheaper. The expensive dressings were 17 times less expensive than the gauze and saline. So I just repeated the point. Don't look at the cost of the product. Look at the cost of managing the wound and you might get a shock. So let's start our inert dressings with simple as swabs. We no longer use gauze swabs. Why? Gauze is rough. It shed fibres which will contaminate the wound. Whereas these modern uh, non-woven swabs don't shed fibres, they're much softer, but they're going to be more expensive. Well, no, they're not. Look at the cost. A 5x5 five five box of 100, $3.96. A 10x10 10 10 box of 100, $10.12. So they are not expensive at all. So this is a fallacy. Again, uh, stereo strips. I love stereo strips. I prefer them than even simple suturing at times. But there are two sorts of stereo strips. You've got your regular rigid stereo strip and you've got your elastic one. Both the same price. But the difference is there are very few areas that you put a stereo strip on that aren't moving. And if you put the rigid ones on, either they will come off or they will, in fact, damage the skin. Whereas the elastic ones will expand, contract, expand, contract. So the elastic ones are much better. And glues. Glues are good. You can only use them on non-flex sort surfaces. And of the two, I prefer the dermabond to the histoacryl because the dermabond has a yeah, little foam tip and you can control the way that the uh, glue comes out. So that's good. Interactive dressings. They help to alter the wood environment, optimize healing. Some are interactive, just work with the body itself. Some are bioactive and actually will help to stimulate healing. We'll talk about those as well. Your selection. What drives your selection? Well, your selection should be based on what you want the product to do. In other words, if you want it to facilitate autologic debridement, you need to choose a product that will do that. If it's a deep one, you want to fill the cavity. What you want to avoid is dead space because bacteria grow in dead space. You have to manage bacteria. 
Again, wound-related pain is often an issue, so you might need to find dressings that are pain relieving. And some wounds need protection, and some wounds need insulation. This is the broad group of categories. I know there are a lot of dressings out there, but you can fit them within that small group of categories, and we'll go through each of them. But I'm going to go through them based on their functionality, on what you expect them to do, not just on the classification of the product. So the first thing we want is protection. Now, unfortunately, one of the most common used dressings in general practice and hospitals is Gelinet. I'm sorry, this is 18th century products. They should be completely out of use today. They are gauze saturated with paraffin. A, they will shed fibres. B, they will help to increase maceration of the wound. We no longer use them. But I know what you'll say. But they're only $1.65. Well, let's look at the alternatives. The modern tools, which are tightly meshed, so tissue can't go through them. They don't all contain paraffin. Some contain glycerol. Some contain eucerite. But look at the price. Adaptic, $1.60, cheaper than Gelinet. Cutie Sarah, $1.54, cheaper than Gelinet. A Trauman, $1.60, same price as Gelinet. So again, it's a fallacy. Use the modern alternatives. They are much, much better, and they are no more expensive. The different types of tools include the modern uh, soft silicone ones. These are the ones we use on skin tears. We use them on fragile skin. Yes, they, these are certainly more expensive, but when you think about it, the older type tools will last for two or three days. These ones can stay on there for 10 or 14 days. So in the long run, again, they are uh, a lot less expensive. So think about that when you make your choices, because particularly with, with skin tears and fragile skin, the soft silicone ones are much, much better. So where do we use contact lakes? Superficial wounds, they'll always require something on the top of them. They have no absorption capacity and they're there purely for protection. That's all they will do. The other thing that you have to protect is the peri skin. Why? Chronic wounds that are very exudative will macerate and excoriate the peri skin. And remember, wounds heal by contraction. Now, if that peri skin is not healthy, they won't contract. So you've got two choices. You can use the polymers, the little uh, uh, Cavalon type uh, wipes, the, the Secura wipes, or in the spray form. These are polymers that put an invisible uh, film on the top of the peri skin, which lasts for 72 hours. And A, it protects from excoriation and protects the skin from things that you stick on it. The other thing you can use are the barrier creams, the Cavalon, the Suda cream, the Convene, the Securas, the Silix. These are good products for putting on the peri skin, again, to uh, allow you to protect the peri skin. The only problem with most of them is you can't stick anything on them, with the exception of the Cavalon, which will allow you to stick over the top of them. Now, absorption. Absorption is one of the major issues we face in treating wounds. It might be a little bit of, of exudate, might be a moderate amount, it might be a lot or a very high level. So let's look at them based on the level. So, not adherent dressings. That's your cutelin, your melatonin, your uh, primer pores. These are a, a very simple dressing of a plasticized surface with some cotton wool. Yes, they will absorb, but very, very little. So you can only use them on dry or low exudating wounds. And of course, remember the primer pore, which is just a piece of cutelin or melalin with a tape over the top, is not waterproof. So again, they will not cope with anything other than very minor amounts of fluid. But the problem is most wounds don't have minor amounts. But I know what you'll tell me. They're about a dollar each, and that's cheap. But if you've got to change them two or three times a day, if it's three times a day, you spend $3 a day, at the event end of a week, you spend $21. If a wound is that exudative, there are modern inert dressings, like your Jetsubits, your Mesorbs, and your Vlewasorbs. These are polymers which absorb vastly more. 
40 to 50 times more than acute lenomelanin. So it means that you can leave them on for two or three days. Therefore, in the long run, the difference is so minimal. A dollar compared to a dollar 38 for mesorb, a dollar 71 for vlewazor. But if it lasts for three days compared to eight hours, in the long run, what have you spent a week? You might need two of those a week. So that will cost you about $3 compared to $20. So again, look at that issue, the cost of using the product, not the cost of the product itself. Film dressings. Normal films have no absorption at all. There are versions that have the little pad in the middle, like your uh, Opsite post-op or your Tegaderm with pad. These are breathable, they're transparent, uh, they will uh, allow water vapor to pass through them. They're a good, simple primary dressing, whether just the plain film itself, whether Opsite or Tegaderm, whether in the piece or in the roll, uh, and then you've got the, the uh, ones with the pad in the middle. Now, the film dressing is very suitable for healthy skin, but you shouldn't be using them on people with fragile skin, because as sure as you take them off, you'll tear skin off as well. The other thing you need to think about is we no longer use Band-Aids. You take a Band-Aid off after one day, the whole area is white and shriveled, it's macerated, because A, Band-Aids aren't waterproof, and B, they don't allow water vapor to escape. So therefore, it's trapped under the plastic and you macerate and drown the good tissue. We use the next care strips. They look like a Band-Aid, they're shaped like a Band-Aid, they work like a Band-Aid, but they're a film dressing with a pad. So therefore, they're waterproof, they breathe, and in the long run, so much better to use. There are some new films. This is a very interesting one from the Tegaderm people, because instead of having a cotton wool pad in the middle, there's an acrylic pad, which A is more absorbent, but B is transparent. So that means you can look through the dressing without taking it off and see exactly what's going on. And also we now have Mepatil with a soft silicone film, which is more suitable for putting on fragile skin. The Opsite people make one as well, as do the uh, fix them all transparent people also make a one that's suitable for more fragile skin. This is a very good post-operative dressing. This is the Opsite post-op visible. Again, instead of having a cotton wool pad in the middle, it has latticed foam, a leaven, which means A, it's more absorbent, but B, because you can see through the lattice, you can look at the suture line. You know exactly what's going on. You know if there's any problem, and that's terrific. So this is a very good post-operative dressing. So when do we use film dressings? Well, heal wounds that need protection. We certainly use them over things like suture lines. Uh, when the, certainly when the, the clips or the, the, the sutures are removed, we also continue to use them. But don't use them on fragile skin other than the ones that are made for fragile skin. And if a patient sweats a lot, they won't stick particularly well. Though interestingly, probably the newer soft silicone ones will stick. So they're a moisture retentive dressing. Hydrocolloids. Hydrocolloids have been with us for a long time. They're a dressing that is backing with, uh, with, with gums and polymers. And when you put them on the wound, the edge that absorbs the gums and polymers. When you take them off, they've got this yellow, pussy-like, smelly liquid in the wound. That's because they're basically occlusive. And in occlusion, you will grow some anaerobes. Look, they have very minimal absorption. So you can only use them on relatively clean, low edutating wounds. Anything more than that, uh, you will get excessive uh, hypergranulation and things like that from the use of them. They still have a role, but you have to be careful as to where you use them. So be careful. They're contraindicated in the diabetic because of this uh, hypoxic environment and, and uh, anaerobes growing, you don't want to use them on the diabetics. Foam. To me, if there was a go-to dressing, it's foam. If I don't know what to put on a wound, I'll put a foam on. Now, foams come in many sorts. The simple foams, like your Lyophone Maxes, like your Elevens, great simple foams. 
And then you've got your soft silicone ones. The soft silicone ones are the ones for the older patients, the fragile skin, the skin tears, because again, although they stick or appear to stick, they come off atraumatically. So therefore there's no risk of damaging the skin. That's your your Mepilexes, your Mepilex borders, your Aleven Gentles, your Aleven Lifes. And the beauty of these ones, they make them anatomically. So you've got one for the sacrum, you've got ones that fit on a heel, and they're an excellent one, particularly for your older fragile patients. But again, to me, foam is really the go-to product. You cannot go wrong. They're absorbent, they're thermally insulating, they're cushioning, they're protective. They're a very good product to use. And again, Let's go back to price. A Lyofo Max is $5.69. If that lasts you for seven days, how does that compare with a $1 cutelin or melanin that lasts for eight hours? There's no comparison. So remember that. There are also products that are foam like. These are actually not foam. A foam is a, is a sponge with holes in it that absorbs by siphon. These are polymers that suck exudate into themselves and trap it within the dressing itself. So they're in fact more absorbent than a foam, but they're not strictly a foam and they're not fully interchangeable. The reason I say that is, if I'm going to put a hydrogel on a wound, the secondary dressing I would always use is a foam because the foam won't in fact absorb the hydrogel. But if you put one of these foam like ones, like the teals or the, bi uh, uh, the biotanes, they will absorb the gel. So use them appropriately and they're a good product. So where do we use them? protecting a healthy wound from the exudate, padding, absorption. Again, uh, they're used for prevention of pressure injuries. There's good evidence for that. And don't take them off too quickly. So they're an exudate management product. Fibers, we use fibers particularly for cavities. If you want to fill a cavity, fill the dead space and absorb exudate, you can use the, the calcium alginates like the Caltostat or the Alticide M. And then you've got your synthetic fibres like your Aquacells, your Dura fibre or Edu fibres. They're different. The Caltostat and the Aldeside M are also hemostatic. Not The other ones are not hemostatic. Not all calcium alginates are hemostatic. The, the uh, ones that I've given you here are both hemostatic and they're very useful after uh, a debridement, after a biopsy where there's bleeding or just if there's bleeding in a wound, you can certainly use them. So when do we use alginates? Again, putting them into cavities, very good. Some you can use for hemostasis. So a useful packing type product. With the alginates and the original Aquacell, the problem is when they get wet, sometimes when you pull them out, they break. So what the Aquacell did was to stitch their product, which means you can pack them in even in small spaces and then pull them out and get the whole thing out. So that's a very nice addition there. Some wounds are dry or are sluffy and we need to rehydrate them. And there are a number of ways to do this. The basic hydrogels come in three sorts. These are the sterile hydrogels. These are the ones that are sterile. You put them on a wound itself because there's no preservatives in them. Now, I know there's some concern about throwing them away. And uh, according to TGA, they're single use. I did a study some years ago where I actually proved that you could use them for 28 days, provided that you use them correctly. So in other words, when you open them, take some product from the uh, pack itself. If you need more, take a clean applicator and take some more out. If you need more, take another clean applicator. Don't take the product to the, the wound, to the patient, the patient to the wound, take the wound, the, the product to the patient. And that way you can keep them. There are clear guidelines on the Wounds Australia website. There's, there's a, a booklet that's been printed about that. Then you've got the preserved ones. That's your solar sites and your solar gels. And these ones are excellent for burns and little minor scrapes and uh, things like that. But they do contain preservatives and uh, still have a huge role to play in practice. Then you've got sheet hydrogels. I like heat sheet hydrogels a lot. These are a gel which come in a sheet and the sheet can stay on for days. Whereas the normal hydrogels, you've got to replace every 
sometimes daily, sometimes with burns every three or four hours. With burns, you can use these for two days. And they're wonderful. You can also use them for little minor pressure areas because they'll help to offload as well as helping with, say, a blister to rehydrate and uh, heal the blister. So uh, these hydrogels are very good indeed. You also have tool type hydrogels like the intracyte conformable, which again is one you could put onto a wound itself. Now, when do we use hydrogels? To rehydrate dry, dry, dry tissue, to put on insect bites, it'll for on superficial burns for chicken pox and shingles. Don't use um, calamine lotion. That just in, increases the risk of pock marks. Use your amorphous hydrogels. Again, you'll need a secondary testing. I tend to use foam. Now, some people are allergic to propylene glycol as a component of some of the gels. But there are two examples, solicite, contains no propylene glycol, that's the preserved one, and purulin contains no propylene glycol, that is the sterile ones. So this is a wound hydration, rehydration product. You also have a very interesting one, which is a physiological solution. This is a polymer dressing, which contains ringer solution. And this is what we use on very hard eschkar, or very, very dark uh, slough. So this will go on for three days and rehydrate that very hard eschkar, which allows you to lift it off. And it's a good product to use. I, I talked about odor before, and I talked about metronidazole gel, but there are some dressings you could use. You could use Actisorb Plus, which is just a simple charcoal dressing. You could use Carbonet, which is charcoal with a little absorbent pad, or you could use Carboflex. Carboflex is interesting. It contains Caltostat, which among being absorbent, also uh, hemostatic. It contains Aquacel, which is all absorbent, and it contains charcoal. On a fungating breast cancer wound, this is marvelous because it will stop the bleeding, absorb, agitate, and get rid of the smell. So a nice one to use. Antimicrobials. There are a lot of antimicrobials, and you have to be careful as to when and how you use them. We've used iodine since the 1840s. So we're a long way since we first started. The original iodines were tincture of iodine and other types like that. We don't use that anymore. We now use complexes, things like povidone iodine, cadexamer iodine. These are slow release iodines that are much better. Why is iodine good? It's bactericidal, fungicidal, sporicidal, virucidal. And there's no evidence of resistance to iodine after so long use. There are a number of different ones we use. In general, we use betadine as the topical one. We use that on surfaces pre-procedures, uh, but often we'll use that on an acute wound. But if you're going to use the solution, put it on, leave it on for three or four minutes and wash it off. You don't need to leave it there because when you leave 10% on, which is too strong, it could actually damage healthy skin. But let's look at the complex ones. The cadexamer iodine or iodazorb. This is a very good product because it delivers iodine at very low strength, so it's not toxic. It helps to break up the slough. It stimulates healing. There's good evidence for this. Again, you'll need a secondary dressing. It comes as a paste, as a dressing, or a powder. And uh, to me, it is the product for your diabetic wound. And the evidence is very clear. It is the only of these uh, antibacterial dressing that we know at this stage penetrates biofilm. And that's an important issue. Again, inidine. Inidine is a nice iodine dressing. This is a polyethylene glycol uh, complex, which delivers at 1%, which is safe strength. And you can leave that dressing on for three, four, five days. Uh, it'll change from being brown to being white. And that's the time to take it off. It's a relatively inexpensive dressing, and it's a good one to use. Silver. Look, we've been using silver for a very long time. Certainly the old silver sulfidizing cream we use for burns. We don't use it for burns anymore. The problem with putting SSD on, an, on a mucous surface is the body reacts forming a mucilaginous slime on the surface, which you don't want. So today we have a range of silver dressings. With burns, they tend to use Acticoat in the burns units. They leave it on for three days, take it to theatre, debride and graft. You've got some other very good silver dressings, the Miplex AG, the Atromin AG, the Acrocell AG, the Biotane AG, all good silver dressings. And the difference between the old fashioned silver sulfur diazine type dressing, they're silver salts. The modern silver dressings are silver, metallic silver. And it works much better because when silver ionizes 
to Ag0, Ag+, Ag++, it is the ionized silver that goes to the bacterial cell and kills it. So silver is very good for Pseudomonas in particular. Honey, I'm not a honey user. Look, yes, honey is bacteriostatic. It will help to lower bacterial levels in wounds. It will lower the pH, which is a good thing, but it works by its high osmolality. It sucks out intracellular fluid. There are some issues with, with uh, uh, the use of honey. Again, by all means, if you want to use many honey or similar products on a, a dirty wound to help lower the bacterial level, that's fine, you want to use that. But I don't use it on healing wounds because I think there is some risk of osmotic effects on healthy tissue. So you've got your many honeys, you've got your similar products. Modern uh, antiseptics include products like Protosan. Protosan is an interesting product, contains two ingredients. Uh, PHMB, polyhexamine methyl biguanide, which is a modern antiseptic that's not toxic, and betaine, which is a surfactant. It helps to lift the crud off a wound. It's very good for cleaning wounds. But you also have a gel type, the, uh, the uh, wound X gel, which can actually leave on wounds as well. So quite a useful one to use. Something that's very old but very new. This, you all remember Usol and Milton and, uh, and, and Dakins. These were sodium hypochlorite. Very popular a long time ago. But unfortunately, these are grossly cytotoxic. They did more damage than good. But the scientists came up with a way of, to make them safe. Instead of making sodium hypochlorite, they make hypochlorous acid. Products like um, uh, microdacin. And these are very effective at killing almost everything, but they're safe. They're not useful. Then you've got hydrogels that also are antibacterial, things like flaminol. Flaminol's clever, contains two enzymes, lactoperoxidase and glucose oxidase. No chemicals, just enzymes. And these will actually retard bacterial growth. So a good one for wounds as well. Again, hydrogel alginate and enzymes. This is one you probably never heard of. This is novel. This is DACC or sorbent. DACC is a fatty acid. We all know the skin produces fatty acids to uh, lower the level of bacteria on the skin. This fatty acid is very clever. It is able to destroy both bacteria and fungi. And it comes in all shapes and sizes and types from gels to ribbons to foams to you name it to post-operative dressings. It's a wonderful one for preventing surgical site infection and it's a very inexpensive dressing. But how does it work? Well, pathogens are hydrophobic. DACC is hydrophobic and it tracks the pathogen to itself and inactivates it. So we can use this on infected wounds, on colonized wounds, and it's wonderful for fungal infection. The fungus under the breast like that, it's very uncomfortable. I use the gel form of this and within days, the pain is gone, it's settled down and you use the little ribbon around the toes for athlete's foot. The other thing that can be used for infected wounds is hypertonic saline. We mostly use hypertonic saline uh, for hypergranulation but it can also be used. And it's a 20% sodium chloride, which again, osmotically sucks the intracellular fluid out. And with a bit of foam, and a bit of pressure, it lets that hypergranulation all calm down. There are some very exciting modern products. These are tissue modulators. They are what we call bioactive. What they will do is change the wound environment itself. You've got a product like Promogram. Promogram is a product that will absorb MMPs, matrix proteases. These are the inflammatory uh, cytokines that you find in chronic wounds. So by doing that, it calms the wound down and a very useful one. And then you've got Ergostat Ergoclean. Ergoclean is a modern dressing for debridement and quite a useful one. But Ergostat is fascinating. This is a new dressing and one of the first dressings to contain a drug. It contains the drug sucrophate. And this is the Explorer study. The Explorer study is the first randomized control trial done on a dressing. This was uh, randomized blinded 
and they compared uh, the dressing with the sucrophate and the dressing without the sucrophate, and they used it on probably one of the most difficult wounds to heal, the neuroischemic diabetic wound. And what they found was the ones that had the sucrophate healed better and faster. And uh, this, the results were amazing. The results were so good that in fact, organizations like NICE, the National Institute of Clinical Excellence in the UK have now recommended this as first line dressing for diabetic wounds and for venous ulcers. A very big study was done on venous ulcers as well. So this is where the future with many modern things will lie with having these bioactive dressings that do more than the wound environment. Debridement is a problem and some people are very sensitive. It can be quite painful. This is a fascinating little product, which is a microfiber pad and slightly moistened. You can run this across a wound, painlessly lifting all the loose material. So it's a very useful one to have. Tapes. I'm very strict on tapes. Only use skin friendly tapes, like your hyperfixes, your fixamols, your medipores, your me fixes. The fixamol uh, also make a skin friendly one, as do the opsite people. So use those. They're much better. But if you inadvertently stick tape on someone with fragile skin, don't try and pull it off. Use the Convacare adhesive tape removal wipes because what they do is, and they're not a chemical, they're a citrusol, they will dissolve all of the adhesive and let you remove them safely. Bandages. Only three things for a bandage, holding dressing on, supporting injured uh, uh, joints and for compression. We no longer use, and I'll use the French pronunciation, crap bandages, because they are crap. Why would you need five meters of a bandage to hold a dressing in place? What a waste of product and how bulky and a waste of money. We use lightweight cohesive bandages. Your handy gauze cohesive, easy to tell cohesive, peer haft. These you need two layers. So it sticks to itself, so you need no pins or clips or tapes. They come in all different sizes. But from one roll, which costs you $6.90, you'll get 10 patients. So that's 69 cents a patient, which is cheaper, $2 or 69 cents. This is fine. You can reuse them. So again, this is the way to go for retention. The other thing you use is Tubi Fast. Tubi Fast is a tubular retentive bandage, which comes in all sizes, depending on what part of the body you want to put it on and it just expands, stays in place. There's no compression on them, just purely conforming and does a great job. Tubi grip. Tubi grip we've used in sports medicine for compression for a long time. Each layer gives you eight millimeters of compression, but uh, sometimes you need to have multiple layers and older people don't like wearing compression. So what we tend to do is put three layers on. We put the first layer from toe to knee, that's eight millimeters. We put the second layer on top of the first layer from toe to the widest part of the calf, that's 16 millimeters. Put the third layer on top of the second layer from toe to about five centimeters above the malleolus, that's 24. 24 at the ankle, six at the mid calf, eight at the knee. And because you're putting layer on top of layer on top of layer, it doesn't feel tight. So people will happily wear it. They can put it on themselves, take it off themselves. It's a very simple, very inexpensive way of applying. You can also get a shaped tubi grip, which allows you to have one layer. In sports med and for other things, we tend to use the elasticated uh, cohesive bandage. These will provide 25 millimeters of compression. So very good for protecting limbs and things like that. But compression, there are different sorts of compression bandages and your choice should depend on what you want it to do. The classic elastic compression bandage provides about 30 to 40 millimeters all the time. Whether you're sitting, standing, walking, running, they're always doing something. The inelastic bandages, when you're sitting down, provides no compression at all. They might feel firm, but there's no compression. But once you move, they can provide up to 80 millimeters of compression. The multi layers, depending on which one, when you're sitting down, will provide very little compression. When you move again, they will tend to provide quite a high level of compression. So to give you some idea, your elastic ones are your tensor presses, your cedar presses, your shore presses. Good uh, universal compression bandage, which is washable, reusable, 
fine. The inelastic ones we tend to use only on ambulatory patients, very useful for lymphedema. So a good one to use for that, but they must be ambulatory. And the multi-layer, we started with the old four layers. We don't use the four layers much anymore. We tend to use the two layers, the Cobans, uh, the Ergo K2s, the Residol 2s. Most of them now have two layer ones. And again, the beauty of these is you put them on for a week and the patient can't get to the wound and you tend to heal things quite well as a result of this. Zinc is as old as the hills. I still use zinc a lot. But I don't use the old visco paste because it contains preservatives. I tend to use Zipsoc or Jellicast or Varisex, and they're wonderful for varicose eczema, but they stimulate epithelium. I put them on my skin tears. I put them on my venous ulcers and in compression over the top. So still very useful, old fashioned, but still very useful. So when should you be careful of compression? Certainly with older people, certainly if there's infection and certainly if there's any uh, potential arterial issues. So look at the foot. Is it warm? Great. Is it pink? Great. When you squeeze the toes, it refill quickly? Great. Can you feel the pulse? Great. If it's cold, white, slower absent, do not apply compression until it had absolutely thorough vascular assessment. And only then, you know, they're safe for compression. You play an important role in assessing and managing wounds. Your choice of treatment must depend on the wound type itself and what you want the product to do. Look at its functionality. It's essential for you to understand when to involve other people because you need to know your own limitations. It ain't rocket science. It's a clear understanding of identifying what the cause of the wound is and deciding on the treatment and addressing things like the intrinsic and extrinsic factors. But again, always be decisive, but know your own limitations. And again, your decision to be based on your knowledge of the patient, on what the cause of the wound was and your goal. Some wounds are unhealable and some wounds require no treatment. Dressings don't heal wounds. They provide the environment. Chronic wounds need a diagnosis. That's why it's not healing. And then do something about the underlying cause. And don't swab as a matter of course, because chronic wounds aren't infected in general. And the overuse of antibiotics is caused by swabbing wounds because every wound you swab will grow bacteria. Does that mean they're all infected? Categorically, no. So there are places like Independence Australia and Bright Sky that you can buy any of the products you need at very reasonable prices and good to know. And this is the, the wound identification product selection chart. There are three uh, little pages. You can download this free from the DVA website, www.gov.au forward slash wound care, and you can put them in your treatment room and you'll find it very, very useful. And I've given you some good websites, the Wound Australia website, uh, European Wound Management, uh, Wounds International, the International Wound Infection Institute, where you can download the 2022 uh, wound infection guidelines, which have just come out and a very good diabetic foot site. And I've given you some examples of good books if you want to add to your library. Journals, lots of good journals, Journal of Wound Care, Wounds International, very good. The Australian Journal, Wound Practice and Research. And uh, if you become a member of Wounds Australia, and I would urge you to become a member, you get this free every quarter. And then the International Wound Journal. Think about postgraduate training. Morris University, has the major uh, wound postgraduate course in the Southern Hemisphere. You can do one, two or three year course. A one year, which is the donation studies, you'll exit with a graduate certificate in wound care. You can go on to do part B, where you'll do more specific uh, modules. And then if you want to stop then, you will go, you exit with a graduate diploma of wound care. Or if you want to go through to the master's level, you can either do a master's on coursework or a master on research. And it is a super, super course. If you want to find more information, go to the Monash website uh, and you'll find all the information you need to on the master's program. Wound care is a group, uh, a group job. It involves a lot of different people. In my clinic, I've got doctors, pharmacists, nurses, podiatrists, dietitian, a dermatologist. But when you work in a team, communicate. That's so, so important. 
thank you. And uh, I hope you enjoyed 